was a man like Moses Who was hesitant to move Helped him raise a staff to the water and walk on through Let's take David for example Who nobody even knew Cause if this kid could kill a giant then I If somebody who was hated could be given new eyes From Saul to Paul you redeemed him and changed his life Those same chains are the breaking But this time they're mine There's a new life way to leave the old behind It's all mad At my best in mind. Good morning, everybody. If you're comfortable, stand up. We're going to sing The Battle Belongs. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us today. We know the battle belongs to the Lord. When it looks like I'm surrounded by the enemy. And it feels like hope is far beyond my reach. I know the battle, I know the battle, I know the battle, the battle is yours. I know the battle, I know the battle, I know the battle, the battle is yours. It's always yours. Oh, the battle is yours. When the seas agree that they should rage against me, and the storm it pours its wrath upon my head. There's a name that's sure to save, it's never failing. Oh, Jesus, my salvation and my shield. I know the battle, I know the battle, I know the battle, the battle is.
and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of so much. We thank you that we can come in this place and just sing these songs. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Amen. So how many people here inside the building online like stories? I think everybody likes stories, right? Why do we like stories? Because it allows us to become part of the character inside of the writer, the author. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the number one book of selling of all time every year the New York Times gets so tired of posting it is what? Anybody know? The Bible. Yeah, you guys are smart. What's the second number one selling book? Anybody know? The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And what I love about the Bible is that it's not just a book. It's not just a book you can just like read once and go, that's what it is. You know, you see a movie and you're like, oh, I'll see it a couple of times. I already know it's going to happen because it's so predictable. That's what I love about the Bible is the Bible is the book of life. It has so much history behind it. And what's so amazing is even in what we're going through now with this pandemic is that it was written over 2,000 years ago and that everything written by the authors is applicable now and forever. And one of my mentors shared this. He said, Freddie, every single day we wake up, we get a blank piece of paper. And that blank piece of paper, the people that we interact with, the people that interact with us, they help to write our story. And sometimes it's a great story, sometimes it's a sad story, sometimes it's a happy story. But the greatest author that we have is Jesus Christ, is our Lord, our Heavenly Father, that He writes the story for us. That even in the times that we feel that we are in a bad story and there's a bad ending, Christ always comes back and He pulls us out of that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that He is the greatest storyteller of all time? So as you sing these last two songs, The Son of Suffering and this new song we're teaching called Make Room for You, is my prayer for all of us is that we would make room for the Holy Spirit in this place in our lives to continue to write the greatest story ever told, which the love he has for us. Well, the perfect Son of God and all his innocence So walking in the dirt with you and me He knows what living is He's acquainted with our creed The man of sorrow, son of suffering Oh, blood and tears How can you there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of Just a memory, but she 
Praise the down and merciful pursue To the sinner your grace And the broken you embrace And in the end the proof is in your wounds It's in the end the proof is in your wounds There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me.
do whatever you want to And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Jesus, that is the cry that we have. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, that is our cry. God, that we would totally be surrendered to you in this place, in every area of our life. Father, we want to be part of the story that you want to make in each of our lives. And so that is our desire today, Father. I just ask that you would bless us today as we uh, listen to your word and that we would be people that act on what it is that you're calling us to do. 
and calling us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hi, everybody. I think you're out there. I can see you. Welcome in person. Welcome online. If you're joining us online, please give Bella a shout out. If you're watching on the LifeChurch360.tv platform, you can request prayer there and connect with us with the Connect card. If you're here in person, we would love to connect with you as well. There is a Connect card in the seat back in front of you that you can scan and find out all the good things happening around here. My name is Tina Morgan, and I get to be the connection pastor around here. And I also get to be the spouse of our lead pastor, Matt Morgan. And I want to just give you a little report that his surgery went well. It was a week ago Thursday. Uh, the pain has subsided. And by on Thursday, he's like, it's gone. I don't feel it. So thank you, Jesus, for that. And he, yes, we're very happy about that. He is learning how to rest, which is very difficult uh, for him. Uh, I keep telling him, walking and sleeping, walking and sleeping. That's what you're to do right now. Uh, so uh, just he wanted me to pass on that he loves you guys. Uh, he's just so grateful for the emails, the texts, the, the cards of encouragement. It's just been such a gift. Um, we even had a visit from Bigfoot came to our house. So, like, thank you for all the fun and creative ways that you have blessed Matt and our family and encouraged us. Uh, we are all about loving God around here. We exist to help everybody build a life-giving relationship with Jesus, and that looks like loving God, investing in others, faithfully serving, and encouraging the world. And you've done a great job of just encouraging our world uh, over the last uh, few weeks, and so thank you for that. If you call Life Church 360 your home, we just want to say thank you for continuing to faithfully give of your tithes and your offering. It is because of your faithfulness that we are able to continue the ministries to reach our community and our world with the love of Jesus. So thank you. Uh, many of you already know this, but we are transitioning to a new giving platform from uh, PushPay to Subsplash. Um, how you can switch to that is either go to our website, lifechurch360.com. Um, I think it says make the switch. There's also a QR code in the seat back in front of you, and you can just scan the give there, and that will help you walk you through uh, logging into the new platform. And it is saving us like over 10 grand a year. So this is a good change. So uh, we're really happy about that. If you are new to Life Church 360, Please don't feel obligated to give in any way. We just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here. And this is just a gift to you. And we do have a gift for you. Uh, if you're watching online and you want to get a part of that gift, just like fill out that connect card and say hi to Bella. And we'll make sure you get that in the mail. But if you're here in person, you can just go out these doors, turn left. There's an info kiosk and our, our connections team would love to greet you and uh, give you a gift today. So thank you. I about, oh gosh, it's been forever ago, uh, was toting my little nephew around. He was probably this big. Now he's probably taller than I am. But I was amazed. He was singing in the backseat of my car. And I was like, he's like three. And I couldn't, like, I was just like, how does that little person have all, he was singing all the songs that he'd learned at church. And I was just like, I'm in tears in my car driving around. And God's like, just said, you know what? He's like a sponge. Our kids are like sponges. They pick up everything we do, the good and the bad. And right now in our Go Kids 360 team, we are looking for people. There's an opportunity for people to love on littles. We need like the babies from birth to three and then three to five. We just need people to be back there loving on them and just feeding into those little sponges. Scripture verses, playtime, creating an environment where parents feel like their kids are safe and they can come and hear the gospel of Jesus and feel at peace that their kids are being loved on. And so if that is something that's kind of tugging at your heart, would you uh, go find a Go Kids 360 team member and they'll introduce you to Shannon or Rachel and get you connected with serving in children's ministry. So uh, just check that out. Today, we are going to be hearing from our vice president of our board, Brad Hudick again, Pastor Bob 
got the privilege to officiate his granddaughter's wedding yesterday. So he's with family right now enjoying uh, just the generations that they have in their family. So I'm going to invite Brad to come on up. Thanks, Tina. Good morning. Well, before I bring a message this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fall back into my role as press secretary for the, uh, the board. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get to bring all kinds, different kinds of news. This morning, it is good news. Yay! Last week, we mentioned that we were going to be revamping and relaunching our youth ministry uh, in mid-September. And we said, well, we didn't have all the details worked out. Well, we have more details worked out. The most important details that we need to have worked out, and that is we've got some point people, some leadership that's going to come along and help us rebuild that ministry. And so I would like to invite Ariel and Rachel to come up to the platform. Many of you know Ariel and Rachel. They've been serving as our campus pastors out at Warren Beach for the past six years, and they've been helping us out for the past month and are going to continue to do that. And how exactly are you going to do that? Now, don't tell us everything because we're making them do everything, you know, but specifically related to the youth, what's your plan? <laughs> <laughs> a plan. <laughs> Well, there isn't a, a plan, so to speak. You know, as we were worshiping, um, I was just seeking the Lord as far as uh, something to convey to, to you and, and the parents, really the parents, especially here and the youth. And I, and I felt God put on my heart the, that, that moment between uh, when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they're, and they're wandering around for a long time and Moses is their leader. Um, but Moses didn't get to enter the promised land, as we know. Um, he, he, handled, uh, he handed off that mantle of leadership to Joshua. And I feel like we're going to be kind of on a Moses mission, where we're going to lead this youth ministry up to that point where we'll hand the, hand the mantle of leadership off to whoever it is that we, we hire as a new youth pastor who's going to be the right person to take it. And so we'll lead him to the promised land. We won't enter in. <laughs> but we'll, we'll rejoice at those, uh, that, that person. And so know that we love, uh, we, we, we love this opportunity in that because, I'm, I'm, listen, we have lots of youth pastoring experience. Just so you know, I want to throw this out there. We've got, especially my wife more than me, um, I'm, kind of, uh, I'm kind of walking behind her tail feathers as far as uh, this is concerned. But we've got just over 10 years of experience in youth, leading youth. And we love young people. Uh, we know that uh, Jesus is not only for the adults. And understanding who he is and his love is not only for the adults. It's something that the young people can wrap their minds around. So we want them to experience Jesus. We want them to know him personally because they make the best evangelists anyway. We know that, right? Young people make the best evangelists. So that's, that's our hope is to bring some some structure, some uh, relationship, some connection and experience with Jesus, um, and then ultimately hand that off to somebody who's going to be able to uh, really run that race in an in incredible way. That's it, man. That's, that's the plan. It. And if you're interested in helping out with our youth, if that's on your heart, <laughs> Ariel and Rachel are going to be out at the Canada uh, table out here after service and really like you to connect with them because... We say it for the, the team that comes every Sunday morning at 8.30, we gather and we say we couldn't do it by ourselves. We need a team. And that holds for every ministry in this church, and youth is one of them. And so if, that's, if God puts kids on your heart, youth on your heart, go join them because there's an opportunity to take the love of Jesus, plant it in somebody's heart that will last a lifetime and change their eternity. So thank you, guys. You... Can I just say that if God's tugging on your heart for either kids or youth, but especially with youth, um, don't let intimidation stop you. Um, God can use any and all of us in all different areas and walks of life. And so, especially when it comes to the youth, we need to show them as a church community that we serve Jesus for our whole lives. 
And um, it actually works better when we as a church of all different stages come together to support our youth and we show them that this is what it looks like to be on a long journey serving Jesus and that it's worthwhile and it's amazing and then it has, you know, good benefits. And so they get to see that living out in your life. So if God's tugging on your heart, please, please come talk to us. Okay. Can we just pray for them as they take on this new challenge? Father, we just thank you for Rachel and Ariel stepping up. We pray your special anointing on them that they'll be able to connect with these kids uh, and connect with the adults and bring together a team of people who love you and love kids and want to lead kids to you and help them walk with you. So thank you for them and be with us all as we walk into the future. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And now I'll switch roles. I was going to make it a second announcement that I don't understand why Pastor Bob thinks marrying his granddaughter and officiating over that is more important than you are, but he did somehow. And I did find out just interestingly, you know, he mentioned about all the marriages that he officiated at last week, and so I asked him this past week, was he going to use uh, 1 Corinthians 13 in the marriage ceremony of his granddaughter, and he said he wasn't. So, I, you know, I don't know what we can say about that, but uh, <laughs> Freddie brought it up. He brought up the statement that everyone loves a good story. We, we all love a good story. When we encounter a good story, if you're a reader and you read it in a book, there's a, there's a high probability that you'll read it a second, maybe a third time. And then there are those of us that really don't like to read. I read a lot because that's where information is. But I really don't like to read, so I don't read stories that way. But I like to watch either in movies or on television. And if you're, you know, that's the way you're wired, you, you tend to go back and watch your movie over and over again. I can't tell you how many times I've watched my Hallmark movies. It's, it's sad. But, you know, we, we tend to do that. And, and then there are those of you who'd say, well, my stories come in songs. Because if you listen to these songs and, that we sang this morning, they all tell a story. And when you find a song you really like, you play it over and over and over again. That's just the nature of it is. When we have a good story, we want to hear it over and over again. I was thinking of little kids. Any of you who've had little kids or have little kids know that once they, a little child hears a story they like, you may get to read it to them or tell it to them at least a thousand times. I mean, it's over and over and over. And so it is something that we just, we're drawn to. We're drawn to a good story, and we want to hear it over and over again. But th that kind of begs the question, draws out the question, well, what is a good story? And the truth of the matter is, I'm not sure I know what a good story is from a literary critic point of view or a movie critic point of view. But when I think about what makes a story one that I want to hear over and over again or see over and over again, it's that as I em embrace the story, I notice that I can enter into the story. I can connect with the characters. I can feel the, the struggle that they go through. And the, I embrace their working through their struggles to, to come out the other side. A good story for me not only does that, but it speaks of values that I value. It reinforces them. It'll speak to my hopes and dreams. And truth is, as I enter into these stories and then I embrace these stories, I notice that they shape my life and affect the way that I'm going to live my life more fully, my own story more fully. Sometimes I don't think we realize how much stories shape our lives, good or bad. But the truth is, all of us have our lives shaped by a story. It's a story that we create, actually. We ask questions like, 
Who am I? A story helps us answer that. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? How do I live out this life? What is the goal and the purpose of this life? As we answer those questions, we create a story that is a story in which we see our lives playing out. And so since stories are so incredibly important, I think it's critical for all of us to examine our stories and the stories we embrace, the stories that we take in, whether it be a song that we hear over and over again or whether it's a Hallmark movie that I watch over and over again. What values, what truths do they promote? What do they tell me? Well, as I've said, I like my Hallmark movies. I'm an addict, I confess. And one of the reasons for that is that they do prom promote a lot of the values that I have. They promote the value of work and relationships as important things in life. You've got to have both. You've got to have the right balance. Relationships, especially a good intimate relationship, is of very high value. They, they promote the idea that when I watch it, you know, and the, one of the char main characters has some children, they promote the idea that it's important to take care of those kids even when it kind of gets in the way of what you want to do. It promotes the notion that life in community is a whole lot better than life isolated. And it always promotes the notion that getting half the story only gets you in trouble. We need complete and regular communication. Those are some of the messages that I get, and I value those, and I'm glad I get them because they reinforce those things in my own life. But then there are some messages that I get from my Hallmark movies that I have to question. One of those messages is that I'm supposed to follow my heart. Now, that's, that's not too bad. I think most of us, as we hear that statement, we know it's, they're not saying, well, follow the love dub that's going on in your chest. You can't do that. But we see it as, okay, they must mean that I'm supposed to pursue the deepest desires of my being. That's in my heart and, and do that. And, and there's some truth to that. But as I listen to that message, I've got to be careful how I embrace it because is it always good and wise to follow my heart? The prophet Jeremiah warned against always following your heart because he said these words. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And you know the problem about being deceived? You don't know you're being deceived. So I do have to, when I hear that message, follow your heart, it may sound good at first, but I've got to weigh it carefully. Another message that they give relates to the goal of life, the purpose of life. Why am I here? And routinely they say the reason I'm supposed to be here is so that I can be happy. Hmm. Well, that sounds good. It fits most of everything we hear in our culture. But is happiness really supposed to be the goal and purpose of life is finding the perfect job that makes me happy and finding the perfect relationship that makes me happy, what I'm he here for. Do, am I supposed to live happily ever after, <laughs> if that's even possible? So I have to, when I listen to stories, wherever they come, whether it be my Hallmark movies or they be something else in a book, whatever, I need to look at the story carefully to see, is this a true story? Is this a story that captures God's truth? For the past two weeks, Pastor Bob has been sharing messages from the first letter uh, that the Apostle Peter wrote to those that were scattered in the, the, what's called the dispersion. And he's picked a verse from the fourth chapter in which he, it, he's been uh, bringing us each part of it. And the first part was he's encouraged us to, since the end is near, we're supposed to pray earnestly. He gave us the Bob challenge and encouraged us to, for the, until the end of this year to make a definite purposed decision to pray regularly for those we love, for the church, for our country. And then last week he, he preached about we're called 
to love each other deeply and that love would cover a multitude of sins. In the next two weeks, I can tell you, he's going to preach to us about being hospitable, showing hospitality. And then he's going to preach, as Peter goes on, about using the gifts God has given us to serve one another. But I guess there's still a little bit of the two-year-old in me. And I want to ask the question, why? Why should I do it? Because if I really follow those things, it's probably going to get in the way of what I want to do. In the, get in the way of what I think will bring me happiness. It'll get in the way of me following my heart. What a thing. I think we can find the answer, though, if we follow all of Peter's letter. As, as I read letters, in the, or really any part of the Scripture, one of the things I like to do is find a key verse or a controlling idea. You know, those of you who've read commentaries know that commentators like to do that. They like to find one key verse or one key thought that becomes the controlling idea so that from that thought they can then put together all the other things that are said in the, in the writing, in the letter. And as I've read First Peter a number of times over the years and recently, I find that the controlling idea comes in the first chapter of First Peter. He makes a statement that he says, make sure I get it right here, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world so that you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You don't know any, or you didn't know any better then. But now, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. Key words. I think they shape everything that Peter has to say. But now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. As I read these words and I think of Peter and the story that he lives in, I think the thing that we can say about Peter's story is that it begins with God. And not just any God, but the God of Israel. The God who revealed himself back to Abraham and then to Moses and the people of Israel, Sinai. The God who spoke to Israel, the nation of Israel through the prophets and ultimately spoke to the nation and to Peter through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the God who was the first and foremost thing in Peter's story. And as I think about that, it's, it's interesting because if you think of modern Western culture, people in modern Western culture argue about whether there's a God or not. Uh, Westerners, uh, a number of years back, Carl Sagan, he was an astronomer, philosopher type. He had a show on PBS, I believe it was, called The Universe. And the saying that he began that show with was, the cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be. The matter energy universe is, is all that exists. Nothing exists outside the universe. There are no gods. Frank Peretti, who some of you know through some of his novels, wrote a number of years back, captured the idea of a world without God in one of my favorite quips about human existence. He said, according to modern Western science, human, our human experience can be described by the phrase, from goo to you, by way of the zoo. I loved it. There's no God in that picture. But 
for Peter and the people that lived with Peter in the ancient world, there was never a question about, is there a God? They knew there were gods, lots of them. The real question was, which God was the most powerful, the most high God, the God who ruled over them and their lives, and how were they supposed to live so that they could please that God, so that God would reward them and give them a good life? So who is this God that Peter is talking about? He uses a word that we don't very often use. He describes this God as holy. How many of you used the word holy in your conversations of the past week? Yeah, I didn't either. So what does this word holy mean? It's a good churchy word, but what does it mean? Well, most authors say, and many of you probably heard it, that the basic meaning of the word holy is to be separated from the ordinary, the mundane things of life, and set apart for specific divine activity, for service to the divine being. And it turns out that this word holy wasn't just one that was used by the Israelites. Their neighbors all used the word holy in the same fashion. Those ancients served their gods just as Israel was serving their god. So we can understand that word uh, to be holy is to be set apart for divine use, but then if we take that and apply it to the God of Israel, Peter's God, it, it doesn't quite fit. So what does it mean to say that God is holy? Well, I'm smart enough to know that there have been books written on that topic, and so we won't get into all of those. But but I think a short answer can be that for Peter, his holy God was one who was set apart from all the other gods of the ancient world. Peter's God was God most high. He was the all-powerful creator God who was before all things. I've Over the past year, year and a half, I've been reading some of the ancient creation mythologies of the people of the ancient Near East. I've read a little bit about Greece, and, and I know the Romans came out of that. And it's interesting when you read those creation stories and about their God, because in those creation stories, it can be summed up with that in the beginning there was a primordial goo, a void, an emptiness, a chaos, use different words for it, but it all amounts to there was something out there that was unformed, unshaped, just ugh. And then out of that goo, spontaneously arose some gods. And those gods then begat other gods, and they started fighting, and they started doing all their things to get control over their portion of the creation. That's not Peter's holy God. Peter's holy God created the goo and everything including the little G gods that existed in the universe. Listen to Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep. That part's where all the other stories started but our story starts with in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surfaces of the waters. So for Peter, his God was first and foremost, his holy God. He was God most high. But that wasn't all because Peter had that story of creation well in his mind. And if you read Genesis 2, one of the things you see is that Peter's God, his holy God, richly provided for his creatures. It says you can eat from all of the trees of the garden except one. It's interesting, Satan twisted that and said, did God say you couldn't eat from any of the trees? Satan's good at twisting God's words. God richly provided for Peter. So Peter's God was the creator, the most high 
the holy, powerful God who created everything and who richly provided and sustained everything. I think, it, again, it's worth us remembering because we, we forget what environment this was in, but in the ancient world, there was a different view of what the gods did. The gods in the ancient world, as you read the ancient stories, basically created human beings to serve them. Things that the gods didn't want to do, uh, the highest gods made the lower gods do that, and then the lower gods decided, well, we don't want to do it either, so let's create man. And so human beings were created to be servants to the gods. How different Peter's holy God. His God came to serve us. And then there was one other thing that I think we need to remember as Peter's reflecting on his story and that God is the center and the source and the foundation. And that's the name of God. Now, we use names. Uh, my name's Brad, and I've checked the meaning of Brad because, you know, in the ancient world, a name had meaning. Well, Brad in English, in New English, means a little wiry, skinny nail, which I used to be, not anymore. But it also, I, I've gone back to the old meaning because the old meaning meant broad meadow, and I'm getting there. <laughs> so, names were important in the scripture, and in, for Peter, the name of his God was important too. In Exodus 34, 5 through 7, we hear the name of Peter's God. It reads like this, Then the Lord... And for those of you who aren't aware, when you're reading your Bibles, uh, the Old Testament part, the Hebrew Scriptures, and you see LORD in these all capital letters, that is the, the way the translators have chosen to put the name of Israel's God in the Scripture, his covenant name, which is Yahweh. Okay. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, that was Moses, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and the grandchildren, and the entire family is affected even children in the third and fourth generation. If we listen to this description of Peter's God, of a holy God that he served, that was in the foundation of his story, we hear words that you'd never hear used for the gods of the ancients. We hear words about Yahweh like compassionate, merciful, loving, faithful, and forgiving. The ancients would have described their gods more like with words more like lustful, jealous, fickle, harsh, angry, full of vengeance, demanding. How different Peter's holy God was. And I am convinced that Peter would have said a hearty amen whether he was with Isaiah when Isaiah had a vision of God or with John when he had his vision in Revelation, when the angels cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is still to come. So as we think of story, what is the foundation? Well, the foundation of Peter's story is his holy God. But what comes next? There's got to be more, and Peter moves on from his story about a holy God to a group of people who have been chosen, if that word chosen, by this holy God to be represent, his representatives on earth. I want to read to you one of my favorite passages in all the scriptures, and I got a lot of favorites, but this one stands out. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are not like that. 
And that is the people who do not obey God's word. You are not like those people, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, priesthood, or you are royal priests, a holy nation, a God's very own possession, purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. I threw that in because that's in the rest of Peter's letter. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for you were called out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you, uh, once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. I think of Peter as he was writing those words. Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times to save his own skin. How must he have felt when he was writing these words about being chosen and set apart by God? Chosen according to God's eternal purpose. Chosen and separated, made holy by the Holy Spirit. How did that impact him? And he had to ask, why would a holy God do such a thing? And then he reflected back on the character of his God. His God was compassionate, merciful, loving, faithful, forgiving. And he desired to lavish his unfailing love on a thousand generations. Peter understood in his story that it was because of God's great mercy and not because of his own goodness or righteousness that he was chosen and set apart to be a member of this holy nation, this people for God. And he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to serve as a royal priest, kingly, who could show others the goodness of God, who could help lead them by God's grace and with God working through him out of the darkness into the light of God. And like Peter, all who are followers of Jesus get to be part of that. We are chosen. We're royal priests. We're a holy group of people set apart for God. And we get to bring the message of God like any priest brings the message of God to the people and brings the people to God. You, if you leave here with nothing else this morning, I just pray that you'll leave with the notion that you are chosen by God. You're royal. You've been crowned. You're his representative, and you've been set apart for him because of his incredible love. But that wasn't all of Peter's story. And I think it's helpful for us to remember the rest of it. It says in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 8, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled. Beyond the reach of change and decay. And though your faith, or through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. Which is ready to be revealed on the last day to all who, who, for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Years ago, I read a book as a, as a young Christian by J.I. Packer. It's called Knowing God. Some people consider it to be a, a classic. It's really worth the read. In that book, Dr. Packer, he's an Anglican theologian, he wrote that often Christians, followers of Jesus, are accused of being so heavenly-minded they're of no earthly good. Maybe some of you have heard that phrase. But Dr. Packer went on to argue, he said, really, I don't believe that's the problem. He said, I believe the real problem is that most Christians are so earthly-minded they're of no heavenly good. As I read the New Testament, Peter, I read Paul, I read John, 
I read James, they're all talking about looking to the things above, looking to the goal, looking to heaven. Do we keep, while we live today, we, do we keep in our minds the picture of the future that God has for us? We need to keep that in mind because Peter mentions another things that most of us don't like hearing about and that, that there will be trials if we follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul made the statement. He said, if you follow Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. He didn't say, if you follow Jesus, all is going to be well and you're going to live happily ever after. So how do we deal with this suffering? Where do we find the endurance to live the way we should through suffering and continue to go forward? And what's more, I think one of the questions is, if, hey, if I do like what Peter says, if, if I'm somebody who's devoted, my, devoted to prayer, if I love people, I show hospitality and I serve other people, why in the world should I be persecuted? Well, interestingly, again, a book I read a number of years back by Bruce Shelley. It's a book entitled Church History in Plain Language. He talks about the persecution of the early followers of Jesus Christ. And he says, well, why were they persecuted? Well, the reason they were persecuted is because they were holy. They were set apart. They were different. The way they lived and the things they did showed them to be different than the people that were all around them who were worshiping and serving other gods. Now, you know, again, why is it offensive to pray or to love people or whatever? I think the reason is because if we really live a holy life as God would have us live a holy life, we convict other people, people who are not following Jesus, who are not following God. And how do we feel when we're convicted? I don't like to be convicted. And so I'd rather get rid of these people and push them out of my life than have to be around them. Now, I don't think the persecutions that we're going to experience are going to be like the persecutions of the early church, where they lost homes, where they were put in jail, where they, many were tortured, some were killed. But maybe we will experience something along the line of this. Maybe people will mock you or us for praying to a God who you can't see, you can't touch, you can't feel. Even Peter said you couldn't see Jesus. And he doesn't answer the way we want or when we want. Maybe people will consider us to be fools when we sacrificially forgive someone who has deeply wounded us and show them love. Maybe people will chide us and call us stupid when we open up our homes and our hearts to those in need. And finally, for a culture that embraces the idea that it's all about me, we can expect to be thought to be a little bit crazy when we seek to serve others in a manner God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ served us. As I wrap up, I want to just share, I entitled this message, you know, you've got to put some kind of title on this. I, I entitled the message, Living Like Whose You Are or We Are. And when I said, I said the first time, a number of people, living like who you are. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But more importantly, whose you are. Whose are you if you're a follower of Jesus? You are one who has been chosen by God, who's been anointed to be a royal priest, to be set apart as a holy nation. You have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus, and you have been made and are being made holy by God's Spirit. How many of you like to be called saints? Do you know that's the English translation, but the real word, what it really is literally is holy ones. You are God's holy ones. And as holy ones, we have a story that says we've been created and are being cared for by a loving God 
who will sustain us through the sufferings of life and bring us into his glorious future with himself, with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if we embrace that story, let that story shape us, we can and we will be holy as our God is holy. Two weeks ago, Pastor Bob gave us the Bob Challenge, that we'd be purposeful in prayer for the next four months. Last week, he encouraged us to take time to meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and think about what each of those words meant and how they were meant to be lived out. I'm sorry for those of you who love paper. I don't have one for you when you go out, so don't look for it. But I do want to give you a challenge. And my challenge to you for this week, after you take your time of prayer, I'd encourage you to just read one chapter of 1 Peter each day. That'll get you through the book. There's five chapters. And reflect on who our holy God is and what it is to live a holy life. Jesus, we just thank you that you've called us. We we know we don't deserve it. Um, We didn't deserve it. We still don't deserve it because of your lavish love, because of your mercy, because of your grace. You've called us into this holy nation into this chosen people, into this royal priesthood. We can't imagine, but help us through your Holy Spirit understand more and more what that is and then help us to have, through your grace, the the ability to live it out so that we will declare your excellencies to the world around us, both through our actions and our words, to the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and his Father. Amen. So I'll stand up for this last song. Let every eye be fixed upon King Jesus. Let every tribe and tongue be paired away. Let every heart be filled with expectation. Cause the King is coming. The King is coming. Open the doors up. Come let the light in. People get ready. Ready to worship. Open the doors up, come let the light in, people get ready, bow down and worship him, we're singing.
Why? 